Good evening, everybody. I'm Ken Furnham. I am the director of theater arts and also the chair of the arts at the Trinity Pauling School here in Pauling, New York. I wanted to welcome everybody to our Pride Perspective. It's our weekly conversation with the community here at TP, as well as alumni and also interested students and parents, and just a really great way to reach out and connect during these times of uh, the Zoom world. So um, it's a really uh, great way to connect. It's our weekly conversation on Wednesday nights. We have different uh, guests here every week in different formats, and uh, we're really lucky to have uh, two incredible people joining us tonight. This is the second installment of our conversations with Ned or coffee talk with Ned, as we like to call it, um, and uh, Ned Reed. And so um, we're going to jump in here today and we're going to share a little information. We have a great guest here, Stephen Hannock, class of 1969, Trinity Pauling, and two incredible artists, two uh, great uh, people to join us here tonight. And I'm just going to be kind of like the uh, the, the quiet MC. So uh, I'm going to chime in a little bit here and there. We had a great conversation earlier today with Stephen and, uh, and David and uh, Regan, as well as Colleen and our advancement team, which was really spectacular. And this conversation uh, and getting to know Stephen a little bit. Um, I am going to share a quick story. Stephen went to Bowdoin College and I grew up in Brunswick, Maine. And I believe that I may have been the Bowdoin College water boy <laughs> when Stephen was there playing goalie. So we're going to, we, we've talked a little bit about that, but I think we crossed paths. I might've been the kid who was doing this public skating when you were out there eating six hot dogs. So um, we're going to have a great night. This will be really great. Uh, I'm thrilled to host this and, 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 uh, and have everybody join us. So again, welcome to the Pride Perspective. Um, I'm going to pass this on to Ned Reed. Says artists in residence up there, and that's kind of uh, very much uh, uh, kind of uh, downplays what everything that Ned has done. Uh, Ned is uh, in his 46th year here at Trinity Pauling. He is an artist in residence, retired last year after being the chair of the arts, and uh, and I'm uh, lucky to step into some big shoes here and also have him as a mentor. Um, so uh, we're really lucky to have Ned. Ned's calling in from Vermont here. And he's also, as I mentioned, the artist in residence, which has been really great. So he's been here on campus quite a bit and also playing a role as we move into the spring semester and everything like that. Ned, I'm going to turn this over to you a little bit so you can talk about Steve. And I've got some information here as well. And then and we'll go from there. Um, but this is going to be great. Have fun, guys. And uh, I'm here. I've got a mug, Ned, for a coffee talk with Ned. So okay. here we go. Good. Enjoy. <laughs> well, good, good. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, yeah. I I've been very, uh, Bill Taylor, Headmaster Taylor has been very gracious in giving me the title of artist in residence and letting Maria and I stay in Writer House for one more year as we disassemble that house and move on uh, in our lives um, out of Pauling or at least off the campus of Trinity Pauling. Um, and I just parenthetically say in, in December, trying to fulfill my job title, I taught a pottery class to about 18 faculty and staff from nurses to, to uh, food line workers, to, to faculty and spouses. Uh, the kids were not around in December. They were remotely learning and we did pottery classes. Brian Foster was a star, our athletic director. And uh, it, was, it was fun to be back as a, as a teacher for a little bit. Um, but tonight's not about that. It's about um, <clears throat> talking with Steve Hannock, class of, class of 69 of Trinity Pauling. Um, Steve went to TV for three years, and uh, where we connected was that he took a PG year at Deerfield Academy, and uh, and that year uh, I was also taking art courses, and we both had the same teacher, Dan Hodermarski, and he was an inspiration to many people, and he, he is uh, certainly one of the guiding lights for both Steve and for me. Um, and I remember Steve in the studios. I remember um, he was one of the one of those guys who was the teacher would let him do anything, and I would go like, "What? I mean, why doesn't he have to do the assignments like everybody else?" Um, <laughs> but uh, then Steve went on uh, from from uh, Deerfield uh, to be a hockey goalie at Bowdoin, and then spent some, uh, and then after, was it a year, Steve? And then you went to Hampshire. Uh, actually, I went to Smith College. Smith yeah. College, right, right. Yeah. Smith, 
And, Smith uh, College, but, and then uh, was in that five college area in Amherst, which is so fertile for the arts and, and all kinds of intellectual thinking. Um, and then over the years, Steve has become a, a very well-known artist in his own right. Uh, he has a studio in North Adams. He has a home in Williamstown. Um, and Steve, you still have a studio in New York City? Uh, we gave that up a number of years ago. Okay, all so right. We're all in up here in, in my mess. And over the years, I've taken my students down to see his openings. But uh, you know, to give you some idea, he, he has a painting that the Metropolitan Museum of Art bought. Uh, his paintings are in the collection at Yale and at the Whitney Museum and a number of other, um, another well, a bunch of other well-known collections. Um, and it was always really, really fun to bring a TP student up to that Oxbow painting of Steve's, which is about 12 feet wide and seven feet high or something like that, and say, look, this guy went to Trinity Pauling. He was taking art class, you know, he was, he was, he's uh, one of our great alumni. And they would go, that guy, is, is his painting here is a Met, and he's, he went to TP. It just gave them tremendous pride in our school. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and oh, so Steve, Steve's done very, very well and has made a career of, of uh, in the arts. And uh, he'll talk about his own artwork as we go through tonight. But um, Steve, any, oh, and I wanted to say, the Metropolitan Museum put out a, a book, um, a coffee table book, like 100 great works of art in their collection. And Steve's uh, Oxbow painting was in that. I mean, you go from Egyptian to Greek to Impressionism and Steve was one of the 100 works picked for that book, um, an incredible honor and uh, um, indeed really vaulted American art to the, to the top of the list uh, in that book, that's for sure. So nice job, buddy. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> the, the Met is certainly on our Christmas list, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I, I got a couple of questions I want to ask you. What, you know, you, when you, Went to TP in 1967. What was what was on your mind as a, as a student entering the school? Well, you know, a, as you might expect, uh, not a lot. You know, <laughs> uh, I was fundamentally clueless, and uh, I think as with most kids that are going away to school for the first time, you just don't want to screw up. You know, you don't want to just make a mess of things. And, um, but my focus was clearly hockey. And um, I came from an area in between Albany and Troy that had sent a number of uh, kids down to TP to skate and terrific alums. And some of the best hockey players I've ever played with came from that area. And so it, it was uh, one of these, uh, trails it was very easy for me to follow of course one of the one of the tough things for me coming in is a sophomore junior and then a senior you know i didn't start shaving until my senior year so in you're playing at top level interscholastic hockey with the likes of billy shannon who was our captain you know senior year you got to understand this billy shannon was shaving in RPI fraternities when he was 11 years old. <laughs> and I'm not exact, may, okay, maybe he was 12, okay? <laughs> but it was just uh, to try to keep up with that type of a thing at the high school level is a challenge that I think everybody makes in high school regardless of what your focus of interest is, in, if you if you want to act, if you want to sculpt, if you want to study Latin, you, know, you, you have to keep up. And that pressure in itself, I think, is one of the most rewarding things you can get from this boarding school experience. But it's uh, being focused on hockey, nothing was like hockey at TP. And it's probably still the same way. It was yeah. just such a focal and such an exciting event. Uh, 
all the uh, lower teams. Uh, when I was a sophomore, I played on the JV team and everybody would pile back in to see the varsity games. They were packed. And we'd see Dave Reese all over the place. And of course, Billy, all these, it was just Roger Demet, one of the best skaters I ever played with. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, who went on to Yale and then uh, played with my peewee coach. Uh, he took over from my peewee coach, uh, George Crow, who was the coach up at Dartmouth. And Roger became the, the hockey coach up at Dartmouth years and later. And Roger taught at TP for a couple of years too. Did he really? Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, he and I shared a dorm my first two years there. He and Christine, uh, um, he taught math. And I think it was his first job out of college. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good, good person. Well, I, I think he's still, I think he just retired. Okay. He, he took over uh, the, the uh, physical education department at Dartmouth, which basically takes on the whole college. It's not yeah. the yeah. specific team so much as it is all the intramural programs, all the lower uh, team sports and stuff. And it's, it's no mean feat. And uh, he's still there. So he must be liking it, you know, but he said yeah, yeah. the last time I spoke to him. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I get this frustrated sometimes, Steve, when I have students and I, I ask them, um, you know, uh, what their interests are, or if you ask them to introduce themselves in front of a panel of, of uh, of parents or something on parents weekend, they all start off, well, I play lacrosse, I play hockey. Uh, who are you? Oh, I grew up in this and that and I, and I, and I play football. And they almost to a one seem to first identify themselves by their sport. And you, you need to tease it out of them like, where are you from or what are your other interests? Oh, well, I do sing or, oh, you know, I, I was in a play or something like that. But um, it's not a, you know, listening to you talk, it's not any different. That, that was the. Well, especially in this period of time uh, in the high school era where you are, you're really fighting to get an identity that's your own. That's right. And one of the most immediate <clears throat> responses you get is from the audience that's watching you perform athletically and where uh, things may be slow to get going. Of course, every class has, we had our Evelyn Drayton's and Bill Kelly and these guys who could read as fast as they turned the pages, you know. And academics was, uh, it was inspirational being in classes with these guys because they set the bar without trying to show off and you could see where it could go. I could never go there. I could never keep up with them at that level. But then uh, we weren't judged that way, which I thought was really generous of that community. But athletically, you know, the intelligence that's required for athletic activity is, is is different from reading and writing, but it's still intelligence. You have to you have to rehearse, you know, endlessly, and you you need a coach, you need a mentor, and mentors are very important uh, at this level. And uh, with hard enough work, you see there's there's a payoff almost immediately to that. So it, it's not surprising me at all, Ned, to hear that people will respond with that foundation in mind first. The, that, the, the sturdiest part of that foundation is where they'll, yeah. they'll as you're pointing up. out, they, you know, except for this year with the COVID, at least twice a week, they had an audience, whether it's parents, student body, faculty, who were able to see them score a goal or get a hat trick or, yeah. Yeah. or make, get a, make a bad penalty and the, the team suffered for it, you know? Yeah. Um, no, whereas the, your, the, your math uh, quiz and your history essay Nobody really knew whether it was good or bad, except the teacher. <laughs> yeah, and the payoff is uh, comes later on individually, but also that also has to do with the uh, the teachers. Uh, the teachers are really key at this stage of the game. Yeah, yeah, we can't forget that. I, Steve, I, I like what you say, and I, I think about how you know this is something that you're always battling in the arts, right? Is to try to pull these students in, and that there's always such a a sense of creativity and that they're, they're, they're being creative every single day. They're on the court, uh, you know, uh, on the field, in, in the squash court, uh, on the ice or whatever that is. And 
I, I have your, what you mentioned right here, which I think is just great, where you mentioned in the magazine, the recent magazine, when you uh, spoke with Maria Reed, you're, you, you're quoted as saying, uh, a direct parallel between the arts and athletics. You say, both demand re relentless practice to reach any level of excellence. Practice develops muscle memory. The moment when an idea comes to life or a play unfolds, you just have to react. In athletics and in art or whatever you do, the, the nature of your preparation impacts the quality of your performance. And yeah. I think that's spot on and it's great. And I, and I do think that those both interact all the time when a student says, oh, you know, I, I can't do that. I'm like, well, you do it every day on the ice. I see you do that. You're creative, you're in the moment, you're creating something, you're imaginative. Yeah. And so good. I think it's empowering them to understand that they have that within them. Yeah, good for you for making that connection because um, I think one, one of the big issues that we have going on these days, and, and I wind up visiting a lot of schools, high schools, colleges, grad schools, and museums are very much the same way as uh, these uh, institutions of higher learning. And I'm invigorated by a, a paradigm shift that seems to be going on now, the, where, where the fundamentals of education are shifting a little bit. I mean, when we were in school, it was relentless study, memorization, and then give it back. You know, what did you memorize? What did you do that? And, and that information tends to be forgotten when you move on from school. It's not really applied information, whereas the thought processes that are happening with athletics and then actually art too, where you get an idea that excites you and you bring that idea to life. That process is much more likely to be taken along with you when you graduate, when you leave that school. And with that in mind, um, one of the things that we were talking about was, uh, um, you know, what advice would I give to students that are in high school now? And, and I think one of the things that I missed more than I wish I had was being able to spend time with a few teachers outside of the classroom. Because um, it's a fun story, I, I, a buddy of mine who graduated from the top of his class at Amherst was looking for, a, a, you know, looking for a new thing to do. I said, well, geez, why don't you apply for a teaching job at Deerfield? You know, that would be, you know, yes, great place to do. And he goes, yeah, I might want to do that. Well, I tried to get him an interview and he wasn't even qualified enough to get an interview. And he's, uh, my point is that the people that are teaching, the men and women who are teaching at these really cool schools um, are, are qualified well beyond the specific classes they're teaching in. And they've all had adventures that surprised them along the way, some good, some in terribly tragic. And for students to be able to share those moments, and I know everybody, we have these uh, advisee meetings, but there's something that you can't get done with 14 kids in an advisor that you can with one or two at a time. You know, I would have found ways to go over and maybe clean the dishes at Hodomarski's house. Actually, I did that. I, <laughs> I, wound, I wound up babysitting and doing all yep, sorts yep. of stuff with, but any time, and you don't have anything specifically in mind either. You just are in the same room with these people. And uh, it's, it's amazing the stuff you can take away from that. And so much so that what happened with me is that I would go back and visit these teachers years after I graduated from the school. And of course I would wind up spending much more time with them individually and that's, and, you know, you've all heard the cliche, you don't stop learning in school. Well, this is, you know, front and center, a, a key example of that. And just being able to spend time with, with these people, it was Hodomarski. We had, I don't know if you remember Chris Dixon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had him. Ned. Amazing. Uh, and who was just, you know, one of the most scarily read, 
people I've ever met. He was, he spoke, he taught at Oxford for a number of years and came to Deerfield for two years and then went back to England. But uh, you just yeah, when get you, around. You remember, the, you'd walk into a, a, his classroom and he just taught a previous class and the board was filled with his yeah. brawl all over the place. And, it, and, and you could tell that the energy, the buzz that was in his head for the last 50 minutes. Couldn't read gonna, any of it. Couldn't read you know, it. <laughs> but he would sit on the on the back edge of his chair with his feet on the it was feet on the on the on the sitting part. Yeah. yeah. And he would sit on the back edge up here. Yeah. And yeah. Perch up he, there and, and talk and gesture. And you were, half the time you're afraid he's gonna fall right over. No, Kent, you would have recruited him to be uh, one of your actors. I mean, he was nonstop and uh, that would have been great. I'd love that. But, I'd love uh, yeah. that. But this that energy, uh, you know, and you, I can see you guys, both of you guys have it now too. Now, I don't know how you go about and do that. You've got to, there are certain, you know, responsibilities in the way that testing is set up now, you have to get a certain amount done so these kids can uh, participate with these tests. That really gets frustrating to me. And, you know, I, I see Eric, um, uh, John Austin. Have you met John yet? Uh, he's the new head headmaster at Deerfield. Oh, he came okay, from, yeah, yeah. from Abdullah's school over in Jordan. Yeah, yeah. And he went to Williams as well, too. He's okay. a little Williams grad. And he's an innovator in education. They're getting away from this exclusive classroom behavior to let kids sink their teeth into other things, which- Yeah, and, and, and Steve, this is, you know, stuff I gotta that. make sure you're reading up on all the magazines you, <laughs> we send you, but but Bill Taylor is doing that at TP. Is like, that right? Okay. There's a, the seniors have a senior project that they, they, they come up with in the spring term of their junior year. They have the summer to think about it. And then during the, the, the fall term of their senior year, they work on this project and it's usually, you know, in collaboration with one or two other faculty. And it's, it's a very intense thing. They could be making a film, they could be writing something, they could be um, making, making, a, was it, making a canoe or a boat or yeah. you know, anything like that. It, and, and then there's another- pizza, They made a pizza oven a few years ago. Oh. Yeah, one student, <laughs> one student worked on uh, his grandfather's canoe as you just mentioned, Ned, exactly. Yeah. And updating yeah. that. It, I mean, it, and it goes into was what you're talking about, Ned, right? With with the idea of project-based learning, that, that we're moving, that yeah. we've been in that direction for a while so that we're working on projects, be it Global Collaborative Challenge, or as you just mentioned, the Winter Projects or the Senior Independent Projects. So, which is always great, which is always a, a great thing to do. Yeah. And uh, looks like we've got Toby here. How did Toby get on this thing? <laughs> I have no idea. He's uh, he right here, Steve, Stephen Hannock right here. This gentleman right here is, uh, an incredible artist. Ned can tell you more about him, but um, nice so, to meet you, Tom. Yeah. Nice to meet hey, you. Yeah. Nice to meet Toby's you. on with us here too. So uh, <laughs> he photo bombed us, and he's in. He's in. So you got to stay with us, Toby. You got to stay. All you right. Stay. <laughs> I apologize, Toby, for that. Sorry. You know, you're obviously on your way to something fun, you know. So, uh, <laughs> Inner, but yeah, <laughs> right. So, Steve, you had to put yourself back if you were given in your senior year at Trinity Pauling, an opportunity to work on a project and it wasn't gonna be hockey. You know, you, you still were playing on the hockey team. Can you think now what you might've done as a- Boy, I tell you, I tell you, Ned, I, I have no idea. Actually, I was actually told not to take any art when I was at TP. Uh, Matt Dan didn't think that that was, and as, I mean, both of you are very familiar with the general, you know, perception of, you know, theater, art, you know, music, it, it's, it's borders on entertainment and sort of frivolous part-time activity, when in fact, it has multi-levels and, uh, and areas that are really responsible for life-changing experiences. I didn't know that. And the fact that art came kind of easy to me, even though I hadn't taken an art class since fourth grade, you know, um, I was I was a TP to play hockey. And that's yeah. where really everything was focused. And uh, when 
what's interesting is that all the schools were in the same boat for the most part, because Deerfield had no art department that year either. Right, uh, right. Podomarski's first year was my PG year. Yeah. And that was the first year they had an art department. And at the time where there were, uh, um, you know, protests, you know, for the Vietnam War all over the place. And what a lot of my teammates at Deerfield never knew was that I got drafted. Uh, I, we, you know, won the New England championship that year, but I missed the AP photograph because I was getting my draft physical down in Springfield because I was out of high school, so I couldn't get a high school deferment, and I wasn't in college yet. A PG year didn't fit any of the draft wow. requirements for deferments. So that was pretty spooky. And it wasn't until I signed on the matriculation line at Bowdoin that I was, uh, and by that time we knew that this was just an obscene disaster uh, yeah. going on over in Southeast yeah. Asia. And uh, so, you know, the, the fact that Deerfield just came around there too, you know, to have an art department. Then yeah. of course now in with you guys, I mean, we, we can't say a, a dramatics teacher. Can you imagine? I mean, that would never have happened, you know, when we were. Uh, well, we got Toby on here. Toby, what was your, uh, can, can you describe your senior project that you've been working on this year? Um, what, what was, yeah, what was, what was your intensive study? Independent. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, so I painted a bunch of uh, scenes around campus, about like ten, I think. Um, and I also did a drawing or two. Um, and I'm gonna donate all the money. I'm gonna do an auction with all the paintings and drawings, and I'm gonna donate all the money back to the school. Very cool. And Good he's got you. some paintings. Toby, can you put up a painting as the background of your slot of your Slide like See that chapel painting. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, Toby's one of these kids, Stephen, that is over in the art department working. Oh, here we go, right there. We just look at this. Oh, there we go. Fantastic, excellent. So he, you know, that's, that's the school at candlelight. That's the candlelight. Yep, right in the chapel. Oh yeah, so I was gonna show. Excellent. You know, another, what, yeah, so. you know what Dan Hodomarski said to me when, because I started off doing uh, draw, pen and ink and watercolor drawings of the Deerfield campus when I was there. And uh, he went uh, in base, Dan kicked me out of class. You know, this was, you, you asked, um, were there any key moments where you knew when you were really going to you had discovered an arc, a life arc that you were crossing over. And that was definitely one of them. When Dan just, he looked at what I was doing. He said, listen, just go out and draw. Don't bother coming to class. And at these schools that have your every five minutes accounted for to be given, you know, an hour you know, twice a week just yeah. to go out and do whatever you wanted. That was a real cur currency. And that really got my attention. Now, I remember what Dan said to Bob Crow. Remember Bob Crow? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, the uh, alumni, he was, he was the prince all on his own. He, he knew everybody. But he was the one who edited the Deerfield Magazine. And Hodo wrote him a letter and said, listen, the first thing a, a new artist does is appreciate what is around him, just looking at what's around him. And look at these pen, and they, they published them in, uh, in the Deerfield Magazine. And I'm laughing because, uh, uh, you know, this, yeah, did one of the, of, of the, of the church there in, in Deerfield Village and a bunch of the other buildings. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, at, at graduation, I had an exhibition of five or six of these paintings. And uh, 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 one of the faculty members, one of the snootier faculty members who will remain nameless came up to me and said, listen, I'd really like to buy that particular piece. Uh, how much is that? And I said, well, uh, I'm asking $25 for these. And he looks at me and he goes, well, perhaps I'll wait for your prices to come down. <laughs> <laughs> I said that to Toby recently. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I'd love to find out. So, Steve, there's a picture Toby, Toby did of the hockey rink before it was enclosed. Is that the way it looked when you when you yeah. were skating? Indeed, indeed. That looks like Williams's yeah. rink too. I yeah, mean, I know. <laughs> played Pee Wee in, in the Williams's rink, and uh, as a matter of fact, Williams was such a tough place because the wind came up that river, and we were so little that we had to change ends twice a period. So each team could be going with the wind for each of the three periods. And while I was down there, I would shovel up a big wall of snow along the goal line, you know, so that <laughs> if any pucks trickled by, they'd hit this wall. And then of course I'd knock it down, let the other goalie build his own wall and stuff. But this is what I think of when I look at these enclosed arenas. Right. And, uh, yeah, that was a great rink now. It's uh yeah. And it's the same rink, isn't it? It's just thoroughly enclosed, right? Yeah. 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 Yep. yep. You can say these rinks took 40 years to build because they first put the ice on and it was outdoors, then they put the cover on. It was like yeah. that for 20, 25 years, and then they finally locked in the ends. So. Boy, it was so exciting. And uh that place was packed. It just uh those games everywhere we went the, the the places were just it was really exciting for a high school kid to to experience yeah. that yeah that's for yeah. sure that's a beautiful drawing toby that's a beautiful thank drawing. you thank you yeah so steve you mentioned you know that the art class that we with the art teacher hodomarski we both had as being a transformational moment um you know after after that kind of spark what, what were some of the other key moments key characters in your life that you intersected with either on purpose or by accident that yeah, uh, that, really propelled that, that's you? That's a really good question. You know, because um, as as everybody learns, these, these key moments that kick things up another notch or expose you to ideas that excite you or turn you on to a, an audience that's more expansive, it's not overnight, you know, you just sort of things happen and then all of a sudden you appreciate them. You look back and you can see these moments of demarcation. And uh, we were talking this afternoon that, you know, I'd had a number of museum shows in the Northeast. And when I moved to New York, you have to start all over again. And it took me a couple of years before anybody even look at my slides. And, but as I mentioned, my uh, my my first show was downstairs from a Korean brothel on 17th Street, and uh, needless to say, the clientele that came up there was rather interesting. But it was up to up to you to get out and get people to come to your show. And uh, a friend of mine uh, was a really re well respected dancer, and we went to this this uh, th this event after. Uh, a dance performance and I met this guy uh his name was Ashton Hawkins who was who knew of my show at Harvard I was a visiting artist at Harvard just before I came to uh move to New York he saw the show there and he was the number two guy at the Metropolitan Museum and uh uh, lawyer for the board of trustees and exact, I forget the titles they have uh, for there, but he actually made his way downtown and came up to my show. And, you know, he, he walks into the place and is, is like, okay, it's, here we go. And uh, I wasn't there when he came in, but uh, he commissioned a piece for his private collection. And then six months later, the Met bought their first painting of mine. And, mm -hmm. uh, and now they have 10 objects. They have five paintings, four drawings, and then the book that Sting and I did of woodcuts and lyrics from his- Oh, uh, wow, okay. Huh. Wow, so that's amazing. Needless to say, we, we love the Met, that's for sure. You know. Yeah, yeah, that was great. That's um, pretty great. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Ned, sorry. Sure, no, go ahead, Kent, jump. What I was gonna say is yeah, I, I was wondering about that because I, I was reading about your collaboration or your connection with Sting and, and with The Last Ship. And I was wondering, you know, I know that you've done some work with him and commissioned uh, a beautiful, some work from his hometown and everything like that. And then obviously that had a huge, huge impact on him creating The Last Ship, so. Yeah, yeah, that was. Broadway. Uh, well, that's his hometown. I mean, yeah. this was the story of his hometown bouncing back from uh, 
you know, 300 years, they were, you know, that's where everybody in the world got their coal. They were building ships for close to 300 years. And then over a 10 year period, both those industries died. It's there horrible. were a million people out of work in Northern England. And he grew up during those times. And we met actually uh, at that gallery, that specific gallery, because all the men in Sting's family are colorblind. It's a, it's a, it's a, chromosome thing is passed down through men in a given family. And so when he looks at a regular painting, he's seeing smudgy browns and you know, misplaced greens and stuff. But when he saw the study to one of my phosphorescent paintings, it actually glows. He's, he can see emitted light, stage lighting. He can see the colors that happen from there. But uh, when he saw my painting that emitted its own light, that was the first painting he'd ever seen. And he saw uh, the study owned by uh, their art director. And the, this guy, Richard Frankel goes, hey, in New York right now, there's an eight foot version of this, you gotta see. And Sting had just left the police. So he was nervous about putting this jazz band together. And he came to, to you know, see this. And we just hit it off. We just, you know, we're both very competitive, but since his arena was music and mine was uh, uh, art, we just, we just clicked. And we've been getting into, we're godfathers to each other's daughters now. And uh, we, we're, every year in Italy, we get together to figure out what the hell we're gonna do the next year. That's and great. some of the greatest projects we've been involved with come out of that just bouncing ideas around. It's really, really exciting and uh, a real treat to see, you know, the, the, the fruits of these labors, that's for sure. Yeah, that, that's a great, to have someone like that and you maybe have more, more than one person who, who is a, a sounding board for you as you're coming up to new ideas or the next, the next move or the next stage or whatever. Um, yeah, you know, with, with Toby here, it, it would be fun to mention that, you know, we've, we've been going, geez, we've been doing this for 35 years. I remember for the last 20 years, uh, we've been going to Italy for, for a couple of weeks in August. He has to go there. Trudy won't let him go anywhere because he loves traveling and, and, and playing. And Trudy wants him in one spot so all the kids can come and see him and stuff. And so after the third day, he's, he's crawling the wall. So that's when I go in and we, then we get to goof around and stuff. But uh, when I first started going there, I would draw in the hills and get ideas for paintings and those paintings would happen. And, but something really curious happened in the years that, that they came after that. I would still go into these vineyards and draw, but the drawings I was doing weren't, I wasn't really, I didn't have paintings in mind I wanted to make with the drawings. I was just in draw, enjoying the act of drawing these things. And while I was doing the drawings, I would flash on these other events and these other projects, totally unrelated to the Italian, uh, to the Tuscan countryside, the Chianti vineyards and stuff. And that was a really curious thing. And that still happens to this day. That's been, that process has been going on for 10 years where I'm drawing in this area and all these other ideas come in that haven't been happening either in New York studios or in, in our now our Massachusetts studios. So that was really curious. You know, the idea of changing the place where you're drawing is a way to stir things up a little bit. And then and it's up to you to, to, to mark those ideas and follow through on them. And, you know, when I wake up some mornings and there are things or things at about 4.30 in the morning, I roll over and I have a slip of paper next to my bed. I kind of write them down because, you know, a, a moment later, it'll be out of your head. They're and, gone. They're gone. Gone. Yeah. gone. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you good, for you. Those... good for you. Good for you. That's I know that syndrome very well. As a yeah. matter of fact, it was through one of these junkets that uh, that we got the idea for the book for this thing. Uh, Leonard Baskin, as you know, he was one of the great American artists of the uh, second half of the 20th century, had a printing press and would do these fine art letter press things with woodcuts and uh, and poetry and so forth, and. Sting and I had talked about doing this for a while, 
But then I, I landed and he hadn't written any new work in about 10 years. And, uh, but he plays so much and he reinvents those songs that he's already written that it's, it's, it's never been a burden. But so I showed up one year and we were hanging out there uh, in the garden, you know, just shooting the breeze. And he goes, you know, I, I think I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a musical on, on, you know, on Newcastle with the ships and everything. And listen to this. And he had already written and recorded 12 songs over like a three week period. I mean, it just came ripping out of him. And I couldn't believe it, one song after another. And he, he was just ready to rip on this thing. And of course, that's what became the song cycle that was this performance at the public theater that eventually became the musical on Broadway. And now that was touring, rewritten and toured until it got slammed with a, a pandemic. And they had to stop right in the middle of a performance in San Francisco, which was really a shame because they, they're they really on a roll. And you know, uh, Kent, uh, you know who wants to do a version of that is the the summer theater that happens. You know, there's a summer theater event that happens uh, in at the Pickering Theater there in, in, uh, in the Bowdoin College campus. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. It, it's a big summer oh, thing. Yeah, Main, Main State Music Theater. Yeah, Main that's State it. Music. That's it. Main, yeah, yeah, right yeah they yeah, want to do. They want to do. It's in the, they're probably going to do it. I. I'm not sure how the logistics are to work, but they were very uh, anxious to get a hold of that. So I thought that was great. And so that is great. Because they have the Bath main boat yards are right up the road. Exactly. Yep. And so they have in there and they lose business, then they get it back. It, yep. It's it's tough. You know, it's there are countries that make really cheap boats. Yeah. And some people don't care about who you're employing while you're doing that. So that's a tough one. That's that's great. Me, uh, you know, <clears throat> making films, making uh, musicals, um, ma making pictures, making art. Um, you know, where, Steve, can you comment about, you know, what is the purpose of art today? Some people use it for social justice and protest uh, things that Banksy uh, does his stuff. Uh, some people are just trying to be provocative, like Jeff Koons. Um, uh, where do you see uh, the, the arts today moving and uh, where do you see your place in it? Um, well, that, that's a pretty expansive question. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I think the, the, the quick answer is I don't have a clue, you know, but that's part of the mystery. I mean, that not only the mystery of where you're going, but one of the goals that you want to keep, whether you're uh, directing a performance or making a painting or creating an opera is you really want to keep that mystery in place for the audience. As soon as they have it figured out, you've lost them. You know, you just, you want to keep them on the, on their toes with the surprises that keep coming. And one of the guys that I'm, I'm inspired by these days is a, a guy named Theaster Gates, who's, uh, He's he's a guy that he's a black guy that works out of Chicago. I, I I qualify him as a as a black guy because these guys are getting an enormous amount of t attention now that's way overdue, and a lot of it is because they're a group of black artists, and this guy's work goes way beyond the color of his skin. I mean, this guy and one of the things that inspires me about where he's coming from is. And you'll appreciate this, Ned, is when you're in the fine art arena, the, the gallery museum system wants you funneled into an area that can be scholarly appreciated, can be put in that category and can go over here and go over there. And he was frustrated with that right off the bat. And now what he does, he started doing ceramics and now he does constructions. He, he, renovates parts of cities. I mean, this guy is out of control. Well, what's his name again? Uh, Theaster Gates. Yeah, oh, right. you got to check him out. And actually one of your fellow Williams alums, um, uh, Sarah Goodman, I believe her, her name is. She is, uh, 
she's the chief curator at the at the not the National Gallery, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. She has a great interview with him uh, on uh, Sam S A A M's uh, website. That's worth okay. seeing. Okay. And this is one smart guy, and and what he's done, he's used art and teams of people working with him to renovate parts of this community. It's brilliant. It's just brilliant. And, yeah, uh, great, great. And, hey, well, listen, uh, I, I want to make sure just because of time and stuff like that. And yeah, let's get to the slide. Maybe can, I want to share my screen here. I want to make sure that we're, I love that we're talking about all these people, which is fantastic. And the Astor Gates is fantastic. And I'm excited about all that. And I'm glad you spoke of him, Steve. But I want to make sure that we don't uh, lose out on you here too so um let's see here I'm oh, right. trying... we a couple of images there that we did okay yeah see that is that good got okay. It? That... okay okay here we go let's okay. see so um okay this if i can this first one is uh this is cool back in the day when mtv showed music videos before they got into all the rest of this stuff they had a thing called art breaks where there were 30 second little quick videos of people making art. And uh, this was shot by a guy named Buddy Squires, who's a dear friend. And he's known, uh, he's best known as Ken Burns' primary uh, cinematographer, but he does work all over the world. And he did this whole thing on his own with high contrast black and white film footage. And this is actually Sting's in my first collaboration back in 1985 or six, I think. So that's what you're gonna see. It's only 30 seconds long, so don't blink. Okay, it's <laughs> great. Yeah, so that was needless to say, the music was played very loud on MTV. So, right. like but it. uh, it's that's a, a, a fun, you know, way to go about doing that thing. And actually, they got so much noise from that art break that they did a um, <laughs> they did a news profile around it, which is really hysterical. We'll show that at another time. But uh, that that was really funny and stuff. So. This okay, now what we're going to go through, we're going to go through a couple of things. Ned pointed out a neat sequence of paintings that we'll just go through. And these sort of happen, they still happen today, but they are they were anchored in a certain period of time. And this is a series I call Squid Boats on the Gulf of Siam. And there, it's an idea that I got after uh, traveling through China and Thailand back in the 80s. And when twilight hits in the evening, these little wooden boats that are probably maybe 30 feet long go out with bands of bulbs all around the, the rafters. And then they crank up these gas uh, generators and these boats sit there all night cooking away this really bright light. And over the, during the night, the uh, prawns and uh, squid are attracted to the light. And in the morning as twilight, as, as dawn starts to happen, they pull in the nets and they go in and they sleep off their hangovers from this Mekong whiskey, which is the most vile stuff. It's <laughs> this really sweet, uh, oh my God, one sip is a guaranteed hangover. But the thing that I like about these is that it illuminates the fact that the squid boats are all just as bright as each other, but they are brighter or dimmer than each other, depending on how close they are to you. In one, one evening I was out there and there was only one or two boats there. And all of a sudden I was, I was looking at this open, abandoned, dark area. And all of a sudden this cloud passed over the horizon and was illuminated from below and then it disappeared. And what was going on is that this cloud was passing over a squid boat that was beyond the curve of the earth. So you couldn't see the boat, 
but you saw the light illuminated on the cloud below. And that was, that was just a fantastic moment. I did a painting of that that was not nearly as, as good as that particular moment goes. So, so that's the little story behind that. That's beautiful. I love it. Let's see, I'm going to go on to the next one here. Excellent. Yeah, now, this is this is sort of an extension of that where I imagine those little boats just taken off as rockets. And then, of course, that brings into mind uh, uh, Jimmy Whistler, you know, James McNeil Whistler, who was uh, <laughs> quite a character in his day, been, uh, went so far as to get into lawsuits over his paintings of splashing paint that were really, many consider you know, among the first uh, abstract expressionist paintings, certainly along with Turner and, and, and some of the impressions. Well, sorry, I didn't mean to hit that so quickly, sorry. Yeah. But that, uh, the, the, uh, the debris that falls down from that, the, those, the rocket pieces and all the paintings I do are physically polished. I rip into them with power tools to polish the surface yeah. the way you would polish glass, only I stop before it gets too hyper glossy. And uh, that gives you these low light situations without having the brightest pigment in the painting dominated by the glare caused by gallery light. You know, you get a little gloss, glob of glossy paint that reflects the light of the gallery that will dominate any white in the painting. So if you polish that down, then you really have control over the illumination and the mood that you're trying to do. And so well, that's and, basically where this continues. What, tell us a couple power tools that you use. I just want Toby to know a little bit about this too. Okay, well, the, these are power sanders, mo and mostly I'm using random orbital sanders now. And I have a number, I have about 12 of them, and I have different uh, wet, dry grits on them. The paint is dry before I hit it, but I spritz water over the surface of the painting with a little bit of ivory soap so you don't burn the paint when you're ripping through it. So there's no dust. So that's a good thing. You don't need any mass for dust that kicks up. It's all kept in the slurry. But it. then you, you create some really interesting accidents that happen in this. And Kent, you'll get a kick out of uh, knowing that this painting was just acquired by the Colby Art Museum. Oh yeah, sure, of course. Uh, that's and a big rivalry was, for you, though. Yeah, Are you all right with that? Are you okay and, with that? And, well, and you know, Williams and Colby Bowden's going on here. About, and you were nice, Steve. Doesn't... Years ago, you were nice enough to loan us some of your paintings, which hung in the bulletin boards in Cluett. And I, these were some of these were not all that big. And oh, uh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uh, no, they're you know, it, the sizes change to, depending on what's happening and. Sure. Uh, and um, it's also, frankly, uh, it's harder, harder for me to do, you know, big paintings with scaffolding now. You know, I'm going to be 70 in a week, you know, so it's like, uh, it's really tough to imagine, you know, climbing up there. And all of a sudden, at the end of the day, you, you're reminded of muscles you never knew, well, you never knew you didn't have. <laughs> you remember them being there, but they're not there anymore, so. All right, let's get the oxbow. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this is an example. This is uh, one of my oxbows. And this is a nook in the Connecticut River made famous by Thomas Cole in 1833. And what started me on this series was uh, the fact that I lived nearby. I was working with Leonard Baskin in Northampton. This is right outside of Northampton, Massachusetts on the Connecticut River. And Thomas Cole, uh, Arguably, it could be the most famous painting of the 19th century. In the very foreground, he's got a self-portrait where he's there waving back at the fans. Well, he never lived in Northampton. So in order to, you know, reassert uh, ownership of this particular terra firma, uh, I wanted to put my self-portrait in there, but one of the characteristics I have in all of my paintings is that I have no foreground. You either have to travel across air or over water before you get to the landforms that are reflecting the light that ultimately dictate the mood. 
So I, I couldn't exactly hang from a Zeppelin, you know, in the middle of the thing, waving at the fans the way Cole was in his piece. So I started telling stories about, you know, how this happened over here and these are the speed traps on Route 91. And it became a diary. It became a template for diaries that kept surfacing. And uh, to this day, uh, we were, before we went on the air here, we were talking that I think I probably have, I have to have over 50 of these done, but they're all tributes to other people. Um, uh, the, the National Gallery in Washington just acquired a big piece that I did in uh, honor of Lane Faison. Do you, did you ever know Lane Faison, Ned, when you were at oh, William? Oh, yeah, I had, I, had him, I had him for classes, yeah. Sure. Really? Oh, so he hadn't retired then, because... Uh, no, 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 and then I, I was back for his 90th birthday in oh, uh, excellent, the gym there. excellent. Well, yeah. for, those, uh, for those of you out there, uh, for some curious reason, there's an inordinate number of Williams alums who are directors and chief curators at major museums all over the world. They all came from this little college in, in Western Massachusetts. And most of that fact was due to three, three characters, but one in particular who was just uh, Lane Faison, um, it was really, really something else. And, uh, uh, and Whit Stoddard was the other guy, another guy who, yep. and, and I, have to, I, I have to tell a little story about this because uh, in the mid eighties, I was a visiting artist at Williams uh, just before I moved to New York. And I got a chance to meet Whit Stoddard who was on the faculty along with Lane while my dad was at Williams. And so and <clears throat> my dad played hockey, he was captain of the hockey team and football team at, at Williams. And uh, to say he wasn't much of a student is probably a little bit of an understatement. <laughs> and, and Whit Stoddard was so cool because he used to keep, you know, fudging his grades a little bit so he could play in this weekend's hockey game and so forth. And uh, when I was a visiting artist, there was an event at the Clark and I never met Witt, but his son was our art teacher freshman year at Bowdoin. He was the art history teacher. So I got to know his son there. And I, I, came, I came up to Witt Stoddard. I said, Professor Stoddard, uh, I'm Stephen Hannock. And uh, uh, I, your son taught me uh, my freshman year up at Bowdoin. But I also have to say that uh, uh, my dad was quite a fan of yours. Uh, I'm Marshall Hannock's son. And, you know, he's got those bifocals like this in the pipe. And he's smoking on the pipe. He's looking at me and he goes, let me get this straight. You're Marshall Hannock's son and you're the visiting artist at the college for the spring semester? <laughs> I, said, I said, yes, sir. And he goes, that's irrefutable proof that anything in life is possible. <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully, my dad was still alive while this was going on. And I called him right away. And he, he said, there's nowhere to hide, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but that's, you know, this, um, the, uh, a large version of this piece is now at the National Gallery in honor of Lane Faison, who's one of my best friends for the last 15 years of his life. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, right. this piece was just acquired by the Yale Art Gallery in New Haven, which is an amazing museum. If you guys haven't been there, good Lord, that's, uh, yeah. that's really something. Their collection is just off the charts. Yep, you got it. And Ned, you know, one last thing. You know, the former chief curator at Yale is now the director of the Williams College Museum. Oh, Pam right. Franks, and she's knocking it out of the park. She's good, fantastic. good, good, good. And what's this Newcastle? No. Okay, no, this is actually uh, the New York High Line. Oh, this, yeah, yeah. This is a painting that uh, has been in Tom Colicchio's restaurant since yep. uh, it opened. And it's it was done, the drawings for this were all done right as the High Line was about to be built. I mean, they, they were basically gonna leave it alone is what they were gonna do. They built uh, platforms on there and planted uh, native um, grasses all over. It's just a real success story. The largest elevated park in the world. 
And, but this is a special piece for me because uh, uh, when, when we lost my wife uh, about a decade ago, the city of, she helped restore Madison Square Park. She was Danny Meyer's right hand. Danny Meyer, for those of you who don't know, yep. is one of the preeminent restaurant tourists on the planet. And, uh, and because she was fundamental in restoring Madison Square Park, when she died, they dedicated the garden in the northeast corner of the park to her. It was a very, very special event. And Sting came and sang at the gar garden dedication. It was really, you know, a remarkably moving event. And uh, but when I was doing this painting, I realized that the people that raised the money to build the garden owned this block and these buildings right in front. So the first building that we're seeing on the other side of the parking lot to the left-hand side of the High Line, you see a photo montage and it's basically a 200 degree shot of Sting's performance at the garden dedication, which is oh, really cool. Oh, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And so that, that was uh, a really uh, a fun way to go. And then if another, there's so many things that are hidden here. Our friend Suzanne Vega is the right, the red portrait you see at the top yeah. on the left-hand side. She was born right up a, a little ways up there. She's very much a, a New York musician. And can, but this the, is a great way to also, can, Stephen, can you share a little bit about your idea about you know the diaries that you have on here, you know the writing and the text and everything like that, and how well, that that you know, yeah. that, that's a this is a good point for this because the diary goes down spontaneously as spontaneously as the brush strokes do. So you're painting an object, and all of a sudden something comes to your mind. In a case in point of that is if you look at the right at the bottom of where the high line foreground is, just to the right of that, just to the left of 10th Avenue, you'll see a picture. Well, that's Tom Colicchio. Mm -hmm. And while I was doing this painting, and we didn't know this painting was gonna wind up in his, his one of his restaurants, but he was going, you're not gonna believe this. The Bravo Channel wants to do a reality show called Top Chef. And they wanna have us this competition. He thought it was the funniest thing. And we just thought it was the biggest joke. So he showed me the, the, the pilot for it. And I took a picture of it and glued it on there because we knew, of course, they'd canceled the show two weeks later. And to this day, it's Bravo's highest rated pro TV show. And he's been doing it for 15 years. And it's right. like, yeah. we're yeah. still scratching our heads. But that all that whole story is written down there and sort of happens spontaneously as the events come to your mind. Love it. Who are the, who are the three gentlemen? It looks like three. Oh, is that from ER? No. I see where know. where are you looking now? I'm looking uh, just to the east of 10th Ave. There, the three. There's up oh the yeah, okay. That's uh, Josh David. That's Robert uh, Hammond, and I'm not sure who the third person. Is. They're the two founders of the High Line. Of These the two line. guys right. skipped right. work one day and went to this meeting of these people who were going to tear down the High Line. And they said, you know, why don't we keep it? And they said, no, 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 we're not going to keep it. Well, 20 years later, look what we have. It's really, so that was fun to have their piece there. That's great. And then if you notice it, up at the top of 10th Avenue, there is a portrait there. It's a portrait I did of my late wife just before she gave birth to my yep. dog. Yep. I know that. And that is actually, I gave that to Deerfield on the 15th anniversary of co-education. And uh, that, was, that was cool because that portrait is over the building that we went to model for Chuck Close's Adam and Eve nude daguerreotype thing. I hide that nude daguerreotype uh, torso thing of a uh, pregnant woman and uh, a guy in a lot of my paintings. But that's oh. one of Chuck's uh, favorite uh, 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 Decara type thing. So it's it's sort of a, we're sort of, sort of recycling our own history to celebrate a current painting. That's great. 
we are we are just we are at time but i i want to keep going here so we're just going to go over and we'll, we'll let them edit and figure this video. out but yeah <laughs> here we go good okay, is this, this all right is if i hit video. this this okay. is the last this is a video that was done as a result of my frustration that at my daughter insisting on viewing my eight foot paintings on her cell phone. So needless to say, you lose a little bit from an eight foot painting on a cell phone, but okay. this gives you an idea of how the details come together. Great. And the music's courtesy of Miles Davis. This is Toni Morrison. She's from Lorraine, Ohio, which is right here. Okay. And this is all the alums I know from Oberlin, including Dave, who you met this afternoon. This is Lori Simmons, her husband, Carol Dunham, and their daughter, Alina Dunham, who's uh, making yeah. a career for herself these days. Sure. She's done all right. And this is the Cuyahoga River uh, that runs through Cleveland. And as you see, this is uh, dedicated to Dan Hodomarski. Great. So that's just one of the stories that is told through that, uh, you know, through that vista. Excellent. It's fantastic. It's, it's yeah. great. Um, you know, uh, I became a huge fan when I, when I found out a little bit more about you. And I missed you when you were here, Stephen, visiting a couple of years ago. And, and then watch some videos earlier today and, and then earlier this week too as well. And it's just so fun seeing some of the power tools and some of the stuff that you're talking about, you know, it's, uh, it's really, really exciting. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm going to let Ned you kind of wrap you. some of this up for us, but it's, uh, I, I did want to just throw in a little thing here that um, where you were talking about in, the, in one of the videos and uh, you mentioned being a, kind of a, I think earlier you mentioned something on accidents and being a curator for accidents, right? And I think that's really those little moments that happen when you're rehearsing a play or you're doing something and you can't capture it again. And you're like, ah, that, how do you do that again? And you can't sometimes. Um, and maybe you can, but you mentioned here, you say, um, you know, I feel like I'm the curator of these accidents and the better you are um, with these accidents, the better painting you get. Yeah, and, and, and I like that idea that these little accidents that happen and, you know, uh, uh, something that happens within a painting that you mess up or something that happens um, can lead to something else. And it's an opportunity and the possibilities. And I think that's the that's the exciting part that happens in, in all art and probably anything on the ice or anywhere that that possibility and those options and that what starts to present itself when something happens like an accident <clears throat> no that's true what and and if you're a director you see that's one of the uh one of the advantages that painters have and that you know there's no army you have to direct you know there's uh right. uh, you you get to manage uh essentially curate these accidents a little more accurately but the the you can't do them on purpose you know they just sort of happen what the best thing you can do is create a climate where these things come about and the same thing you do when you're directing uh you, the thing i love about theater though that that I think we need to appreciate right now is that um, you know, you know I, I have a lot of friends that are in the culture arena. And when we look at the ways that we're gonna be able to get our culture back on track, get the, our society back into the game that is never gonna be entirely the way it was a couple of years ago, but one of the neat things I like about theater is that theater is the canary in the coal mine for the rest of the culture. Because what happens is in order for a simple idea to be brought to life, whereas I can just rip through a glob of paint with a power tool or go back and, and correct something or add a knife slash to it, the simplest idea in theater needs a team. You know, you need a team to uh, adjust the writing, to digest the writing. You need 
teams to practice, you know, teams to raise money. So, I mean, it's, it requires so many t- people. And what I'm really enjoying is particularly being in Williamstown where we get a lot of these actors up from the city who work with the summer theater programs and, or they just come up here to hang out. And they're the ones that are uh, thinking about the next move. And, and what I'm hearing from the theater guys is things like, uh, theaters, uh, theater tickets that are going to be available on your phone that have to be accompanied by a rapid test that day. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to get much larger audiences into a thing. Of course, you need uh, uh, evidence of a vaccine and so forth. And and it's painters don't think in terms of that. We're just trying to figure out how that you know, splotch turned into that. And it's actually okay, let's leave it alone. But that's so fundamental. Whereas theater, they're embracing, you know, an expression, but how it's going to immediately affect a lot of people. And that's really instructive. That's, uh, painters gain a lot from theaters. That, that, that without question, that's for sure. Well, I, I think that maybe those will go hand in hand that, you know, the galleries will be doing the same thing and some of these places will be doing some of the same things. It'll become an event. It'll become something that, you know, that has, uh, you know, different qualities to it in different ways, like you're talking about if it's on your phone, something to scan in and how you do that. Uh, I think everything's going to change and I think everybody will be trying to figure it out, you know, um, yeah. as we, as we go along. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that we all look, you know, those of us that are in the game, we have an eye on the theater. What are you guys doing now? Whenever we see it, what's going on, because yeah. they're in the lead. They're the ones who are experimenting. Oh, we tried this. It didn't work. Right. You know, and we're sitting there going, huh? But, you know, we, you know, it's really, well, and it's, I think it's during this time too, you see something like Lincoln center, like they've got this great space, this open space there. And now they're like, okay, why haven't we been using this space in, in all different aspects? And they have this outdoor space now and they're like, okay, this is what we're gonna do starting April 1st. And, and I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more of that. We're gonna see, I think outdoor gallery spaces, we're gonna see outdoor you know, events, bands, music, theater, film. I think it's gonna be, I, I, I do, I, it's exciting. It's, it's really kind of you know, amazing to see what happens. Um, but uh, I, I want to let it, Ned kind of sign us off here. I know that we've gone over about 12 minutes here, but uh, this has been great. It's been really great. I'm glad Toby Burner came on to help us out here and, uh, and chime in, which is really nice to see you um, and, and have everybody here. And of course, we just barely even touched on some of the things that you've done, Stephen, in, in regards to film and all of that and, uh, and you know, and who, you know, uh, just how much filmmakers have inspired you and all of that. and, and all those ideas. So we'd love to do this again and, and let's do it. Let's do it. Especially let's, you know, turn this uh, lemons into lemonade here. We get to do these <laughs> four, four boxes here and we can do it a lot easier than we used to. So um, yep, Ned, yep. take us away here and uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there. No, just a, a great shout out. Thank you, Steve. And uh, I'm just sort of seeing generations here. It's Toby, one of my, the last students that, I, that I've taught and, and Steve, one of the first TP alums that I learned was an artist and it's just, you know, the kind of bookend tonight is kind of very, very interesting for me. So um, here's to the arts, here's to the arts at TP and uh, thank you all for, for being part of it. Thank you. Thank Kent you very too. much for Richard, joining thanks, us. Yes, thanks yes. so much for having me, you guys. I appreciate thanks, it. Stephen. Yes, we'll see everybody at the next Pride Perspective. So thank you very much okay. for joining us. All right, good night. Hey guys. Kent, Kent, Kent,